natural perspective and other code and federal regulations. Data sources, that's an extremely important component. Base data validation. Components of the capitated rate, so what are the components of that capitated rate? And when I say capitated rate, um, as Representative Heath did mention, rate cell is what I'm referring to. So I believe in the state of Iowa, our managed care program, we have approximately 56 of those various rate cells that are paid out on a monthly basis. And then monitoring process, I call medical loss ratio, sometimes here referred to as health care ratio as well. So turning to the next page, CMS regulations. Really what CMS looks at the actual uh, determined rates that we send to them for approval. They're applying three principles from these regulations. You know, they're looking at the capitated rates and they're really asking, are they reasonable and do they comply with all law? That's first and foremost, reasonableness. And they must comply with all federal, state law. Second thing during the rate development process that really is looking at, the, uh, are they applicable? For the Medicaid program, including you know, eligibility, looking at the eligibility, benefits, financing, and any applicable waiver. So we also, within the state of Iowa and other states, you know, we can, uh, really manage your managed care programs with the waiver, either an 1115 or a 1915 uh, waiver. So do we meet the requirements of those waivers when these rates are set to? And then new. Um, more stringent actually is the documentation has to be sufficient to demonstrate that the rate process meets this code of federal regulations 438 and that is the new managed care rule uh, that went into place a couple of years ago and some effective dates are still coming up in the future. Page four, you've heard this many times, you've heard me say it, you're probably very familiar with actuarial soundness. So this kind of gives you the definition of actual soundness here on page four. I'm not going to read it to you, but really what it states is, are they projected for all reasonable, appropriate, and attainable cost on the terms of the contract? So we're asking our managed care organizations to provide services to our members, eligibility, and those who are um, by population. So you have HCBS populations, you have women, you have children, you have other waiver populations. So we're asking was managed care organizations to make payments to those providers who provide services to our members. So when they look at actual soundness and they take a look at the development process, did we go through the process and develop these rates? Are they appropriate for what we're really asking the NCOs to provide for our members? On page five, I want to make sure we understand what actual soundness is not. So uh, I'll read all three of these, but I think it's very important. It's not a budget-driven process, so you don't have a budget in mind or a specific number and say, that's what we're going to do with the capitated rates. It's not budget-driven, it cannot be. It is not a methodology that has a predetermined outcome. And it is a process that, for the most part, eliminates all rate variance between the managed care organizations. And then what really it is, in actual soundness, it's really performed by a qualified actuary. It's a process designed to evaluate risk within all the programs. And it's really a process that minimizes those variance among those NCOs. Turning to page six is some of the deadlines and the effective dates for some of the requirements with the new managed care rule that went into effect. Uh, one I want to highlight is July 1st of 2018. Uh, it requires certification by rate cell. Prior to this, the actuaries and state programs and CMS allow a certification of a range. So when I say a range, you have particularly, it could be anywhere, and these are not real numbers, it could be from $100 to $180. So they, we could certify that range, and we could set the rate within that range, anywhere within that range, <coughs> toward the low end or toward the high end, and that's the state's decision. But effective with this rule and this date, CMS came out and said, no, you have to certify a point in the range. So it's no longer a range. You have to certify that point. Um, and there was language in the regulation that allowed a 1.5% increase or decrease without recertification of the rates. So one of the processes at the end of the certification, the actuary actually does a certification. Uh, they write the director of the letter certifying the rates, they go through the process, the methodology, the assumptions, the trends, etc. And that is submitted to CMS along with the amendment 
for the contract for the rates, and that's the process, and that's what CMS uses to approve the rates. Uh, about 30 days ago, three weeks ago, CMS has been taking a lot of feedback from uh, Medicaid directors and others in the industry relative to rate setting component of, of this new managed care rule. The, the rule itself is about 1,400 pages, so there's a lot in the rule just besides rate setting requirements. Stating that this actual certification by rate at a point took away a lot of flexibility for states. The states, when they were able to certify a range, you could have managed care organizations come in and actually um, state or bid that they, hey, we can perform these services at the lower point of the range, for example. But if I have to certify at a point, then that takes that away. Um, so CMS a few weeks ago now has increased a little more flexibility. They went through and took a look at the rule. It's out for comment. I'm not sure what the deadline is. But it was a, another 130 pages in addition to the 1,400. They kind of went in. They took a lot of feedback from national associations of Medicaid directors and others as far as how we need to look at the rate setting. They took a look at the IMD exclusion and some other things. So it, it's good for Medicaid programs across the country. The other one I want to point out is July 1st of 2019. And these effective dates for state programs, it's effective the rate period after the, the uh, timeline here. So for example, July 1st of 2019 won't be effective for us until the next rate period after this date, so it'll be 2020. The last one, 2019, July 1st, really is CMS's rate review. They're going to start looking on the reporting of the 85% of the medical loss ratio. On page seven, uh, kind of discuss some of this uh, as well. But you know, the final rule really introduced a new level of review with respect to the capitated rate payment process. It really has been over the last five or six years. It's been very um, CMS has, has been very uh, kind of ambiguous in some of the process and how they went through the review rates. For example, when you submit rates, normally states do it on an annual basis. So they renew the rates on. Basis. You'll submit the rates and the contract amount with the CMS, and they have the review. Um, it was not out of the ordinary for me to receive more than 100 questions relative to the rate development process. Um, now, with the, the process that they've introduced, and, and it has gotten much, much more efficient, I believe the last time we received questions were about eight questions. So, going through their process, their checklist, and having that education training with the actuary firms has really uh, been a benefit to that process. The Office of the Actuary is the uh, office within CMS that approves and reviews those rates. We call it OACT. Page 8, it just kind of illustrates how our actuary, who's Optimus, utilizes what they call the actuarial control cycle. And he's kind of taking a look at that cycle, you identify the problem. You design the solution and then monitor the results throughout the, the year. Page nine, we start talking about data sources. Optimus and other vendors and other actuaries as well, they use multiple years of historical data when you go through this rate development process. So they have, and this is what we provide to them, so they have detailed enrollment data, they have detailed encounter data, and that encounter data is claims data. Supplemental data extracts if needed. And then they do also utilize audited financial statements. NCOs and states are required to submit audited financial statements to the state insurance department. So Optimus will get copies of that and have that as a documentation as well. And in addition to that, we provide to the MCOs and they complete that, they call this MRT, which is a very detailed comprehensive spreadsheet. And it actually probably 11, 12 different tabs on that spreadsheet. So they're really filling in their expenses by category service, by population, and Optimus uses that as well. Kind of so you can do a cross-reference and check between uh, the encounter data, the financial statements that are filed, uh, the MRT that's submitted, so you can get, uh, as you go through that validation process of the data, to ensure that you're determining an accurate rate Base data validation on page 10. 
really the, the second and third bullet point, kind of taking a duration review over time. So they're looking for consistency across time. So they're looking at expenditures or dollars, units of service by month, membership by month, just to see if there's any inconsistency. You would expect to see minor increases or decreases over the period of time, but you don't want to see significant changes. If they do see some significant, then they'll do that research and find out what's causing that. They'll, as I said earlier, compare some accounting data to financials. So, as MCOs, um, I'm going to back up just a little bit and explain accounting data just so make sure we're all on the same page. When the providers provide service to the members, obviously the provider submits a claim to the MCO. That claim is adjudicated, the provider is paid, and then on a weekly basis, the MCO is submitted to the state on a 837 file uh, in counter data, which is a lot of the claims information. And there's a certain requirement for them to submit that in counter data in a timely manner. There's actually a performance measure in place for them to do that. And the reason that's so important is because this is what's really used to determine the rates along with other documents. But it's extremely important to have this in counter data timely and accurate. So that's why we do that. And CMS also requires a new regulation that we have them submit timely and accurate 837 or account data. So that's why it's extremely important. But reviewing that information, kind of comparing it to the financial and account data is an important part of that process. Page 11. Now this is kind of the first step in establishing what we call the base rates. Um, you look at the Medicaid and capitated rate, and it contains the following key components. So we've gone through the base data validation, so we've validated that base data. The process is described in previous slides, as stated. Once that's complete, they recommend a base data period to the state. So they may look at three different years and look at the validation process for consistency over time, but they're going to recommend to the state what base period they want to use for the rates. Normally it's a 12 month period, it's the most current 12 month period, which you have to remember, the county data has a lag. So it's not like last month, um, but they do take into consideration some other things for that. So once they do that, then we start looking at that base rate and we start building that base rate um, to get to the final capital rate. And when I say that, that base rate really only uh, has the account data of what has happened so it's based on actual experience, as Director Fox over the state. You know, how many times our members went to the emergency room, inpatient stays, utilization of drugs, all those things that we provide in the Medicaid program is captured in this base data validation process. And it really is assigned a, a base rate or cost per population from those rate cells. Now we have to start looking at changes in the program, for example. So if we have significant policy changes, for example, legislation is passed that we have to implement. We have to ensure that we have that in the rate as well. Because as Director Fox would have said, if, if we are asking the MCOs to have the providers provide services to our members, either new in legislation, mental health services, for example, is a prime example for the 1920 rates, we need to include that in the, in the rate. So we will go through that process too, and we will project what we believe the utilization is going to be. I mean, you, you don't know, but the actuaries are very good at, at projecting. Uh, they will work with IME staff and just determine what do we expect the trend to be with respect to utilization. Uh, and it's not how many times do we expect members to use those services, right? These are new services, so we don't exactly know. But then going through that cycle again, we're going to monitor that because it's candidate is submitted, and we have that new policy or new service in place, we're going to monitor those expenditures on an ongoing basis. On page 12, kind of continuing that, then we kind of look at projection factors, efficiency adjustments. And, and to do this, an actuarial firm will go out and they, they really will do market analysis with environmental scans, they'll go out and read journals, uh, periodicals, Information has been published by various consultants relative to where those healthcare consultants see the trend uh, in healthcare. It could be as specific as pharmaceuticals. It could be even more specific on like a particular drug or a new drug that's coming on the market. So they go out and do all this research and then make a projection. What do we believe that utilization may be in the state of life? And then we will have that built into the rates as well. So that component then becomes what we call a medical load. 
and you also have heard the non-medical loans. And Optimus uses financial information from the MCOs to really develop what that non-medical load is. And that non-medical load will include administration as well as care coordination and quality assurance costs. So it's not just, as I've said before, what I consider true admin would be your pen, your paper, your lease, those types of expenses, salary expenses. But this also includes care coordination costs. Take a look at page 13. Take a look at the minimum or medical loss ratio. The new Medicaid managed care rule requires states to monitor that. There's been a, a misconception for several years that uh, CMS is requiring minimum loss ratios. For a medical loss ratio, they are not. It's 85% in the rule. We just have to monitor and report what the medical loss ratios are with the state. You can see what the numerator includes, the denominator. Um, but obviously, the MCOs, the incurred claims, are in the numerator activities to improve the health care quality, fraud detection, so the health care quality of the care coordination costs. And you kind of see what the denominator is. Uh, it does not include, it's just premium fee revenue, so if we exclude federal taxes, state taxes, local taxes that they pay, that's not part of the revenue they include in that calculation. And this is something that the states don't define as far as medical loss ratio. That's something that CMS is I believe that they have adopted the definition of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. We went through a very lengthy process to kind of define what they believe that loss ratio should be. So that's what the state of Iowa uses as well, what CMS has as far as the definition of that loss ratio. Thank you so much. And finally, on page 14, kind of monitoring the process of that loss ratio. Uh, in the state of Iowa, the contract is 88%. But all we are doing, uh, states must align that non medical load assumption with no load requirement of 88%. And the really intent of that is that there's not a high probability of incorrect projection. So we want to make sure that we have to project the rate through midpoint of the rate period. So we have to go through June 30th of 2019 for a calendar year. You have to project the trends through that period of time. This is simply for us to monitor the medical loss ratio. Uh, I think there's some confusion that you see about 88% medical loss ratio and the automatic by 12% admin. That's just not the case. So there's really not that direct correlation with that 88%. So with that, I will be happy to answer questions. There is the component of, of what you just stated is that in the contract, the minimum loss ratio or medical loss, the minimum medical loss ratio, you have to have 88. So it, can, it sh cannot go below the 88. But that doesn't mean that that's what the medical loss ratio is and how the rates are set at a point in time. So right now, I can tell you that the medical loss ratio for the current fiscal year is not based on 88% and the admin rate is not 12% within the state fiscal year 19 rates. That is something we can't go below. So ADA is something you cannot go below. That's why we monitor that. But it doesn't mean that that's exactly what we're going to pay out. It's a, it's a point of reference for the medical loss ratio. My interest is to make sure 
that the new money that we come forward with will be directed to the healthcare aspect of our client and that we are restricting the MCOs to only a certain percentage of that new money. You're telling me that that's not going to be the case? No, I'm telling you the restriction is still there because it's in the contract language. So it's not going to go below that. So that, that, that protection is there, okay. but necessarily right now in the current rates, it's not at 88 and 12. That's what I'm saying. And my next question is going into the cells. Give me a definition of a cell. <laughs> okay, a, a rate cell is a cohort. So for example, we have, I think there are 56. When you set rates and a capitated rate per member per month, you have to do it based on common characteristics of a member. So that's what we mean by cohort. A cohort is groupings of common characteristics of the members. So for example, I can't group a long-term care member who's in a nursing home with a young child who's five years old because their cost, their characteristics are not the same and their costs are not going to be the same across the healthcare continuum. So that's what I mean by rate cell, it's simply a cohort. So I understand that I'm trying to get to the base rate. I mean, I'm going beyond the capitation and I'm going down to the provider and I'm looking at the base rate that they are guaranteed that they're going to get paid for what they do. So, uh, I, the thing, I'm, the thing uh, that puzzles me is, is that I understand how we came up originally with the original base rates. We went to cost reports and looked at where they were supposedly 18 months before the implementation of our managed care program. So time moves on and costs move on. So what do we have in our base rates that allow for inflation, um, demand for healthcare workforce, which are hard to hire, and, and uh, right now um, a lot of our people out there delivering services for our nonprofits are, I consider, underpaid for what they do. I mean, how how do we address this inside a managed care program? allow for the inflation pressures or other things that say our base rate needs to change and it needs to be increased. How do we do that? I want to make sure we all understand that when I'm talking base rate here during this capitated rate development process, it's not anything to do with the reimbursement rate for the providers out in the state of Iowa. So completely separate. So to answer your question, if you want to increase the reimbursement rate, then there's a process you go through from the legislative process, administration, you know, sign the any past legislation. But from my perspective, if any intent to increase reimbursement rates for whatever provider type, and there are certain provider types right now that have cost reports on a regular basis, right? They get rebased. So if we were to go through that process, there would have to be some type of cost reporting process again, because I believe it's important to understand what those costs are if we want to increase the rates. We just can't arbitrarily state that we believe it should be increased 5%. I think you have to go through the process to see truly what those costs are, and then you know, go through that process and make a decision whether there uh, is legislation is introduced to increase the, the rates. As a, as a Medicaid director, I do not have the authority to increase reimbursement rates. So here we are, two and a half, what is it, two and a half years we've been in this now? Is that right? I, I think it began April 1st of 2016. Okay. Yes. Are the base rates, the current base rates toward our providers, okay, are they still the same rates as they were two and a half years ago? There's been changes in, in rates depending on the provider type. I mean, there have been increases for um, long-term care, you know, rebasing those types of rates. There have been some rate increases relative to uh, policy changes. I don't have all the, the, the entire list in front of me, but there's also been increases based on new requirements from the federal government. Uh, and anytime there's a, an increase, then we go and increase those rates. 
for those provider types. So if, if a group of providers or a provider negotiated with an MCO on a new reimbursement rate, um, that MCO is taking the risk of providing a higher reimbursement rate because they are only being dealt per member per month in the contract. So the point I'm trying to get at is, is that um, I, 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 I think the rigidity of where we were when we started and my suspicion that the rates that were then are the same base rates now, even though these providers can negotiate for a different rate, if they do so, and money is an increase to the MCOs, they're taking the risk of going backwards rather than being able to sustain themselves on down the line. I'll make one more point. I think Director Foxhoven would like to make a point in the sense that any contractual rate that the MCO has with the provider is part of that encounter data. So we don't use the fee schedule to determine the capitated rate. We use the encounter data, which includes that contract rate. So if the fee schedule says $100, but because there may not be enough uh, providers in a certain area of the state, the MCO goes out and contracts at $103, 103%, that $103 is part of the encounter data, which is used to develop the cap rate. So it does, so it does expand, so what you had said, Representative Heaton, about if they negotiate a rate higher with that provider, they're taking the risk of just eating it only for that contract period, because then it's going to drive up the encounter data, and when the actuary looks back to set the rates for the next year, it's going to say they had to pay these providers more money, and so that's increased the cost, and that's going to increase that rate. Well, we did see the demise of one of our MCOs for that very reason, that the contract that they negotiated, they couldn't, I think there were other, they couldn't make ends meet dealing with that difficult population. There were certainly other reasons why, I why, why they were demising, and I would say that, I would tell you that some of the representatives of that company have told me they thought they pulled the plug too soon, that they thought they should have stayed. So I've taken enough time. Thank you very much for answering the question. You're welcome. Representative okay. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here with us today uh, and explaining much of this to us. My question goes back to the admin and the medical loss ratio. Can you share with me what the most current uh, ratios are for each of those? And maybe you didn't. I missed it, so I apologize if you gave me those. Give me one second. I do have it. Okay because uh, I uh, was fairly certain that question would come up. The current non-medical load in the state fiscal year 19 rates is a range 7.3 to 7.6 percent. That includes the traditional admin, which is a range from 5.3 to 5.6, and then care coordination and quality assurance 1.7 to 2.0. But the total non-medical load is about 7.3. Now, as and, and opposed to the 12. as opposed to the 12. So, and, and there's a small range there because there's an actual admin and care coordination component built for each rate cell. Because it's going to cost more for a uh, long term services member from a care coordination admin perspective than a five year old child. So, there, there's a range. Thank you. Um, Senator Sigelbart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, guys, for being here this morning. Very simple question. Uh, Optimus, they replaced Milliman? Correct. And at what point did that happen? I believe it. I don't have the exact date, but it was not. It was not. Jan January, 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 I believe, January. right after I began. Uh, Not 18. 18. So the last 11 yeah. months. And, and, and this goes to Thank you for being here, Director Randall and Director Foxhoven. A um, couple of questions to start out with, just kind of a uh, 
your opinion, I guess, Director Randall, um, when we were first presented with uh, managed care and and the Milliman actuarial, um, as that moved along, we received complaints from at, at least two MCOs about flawed data within that actuarial. Um, one of the, the data pieces was about prescription drugs. So as we're now using Optimus and their data around the use of prescription drugs or that actuarial about that or the pricing, how are you confident in what Optimus has presented to you versus what Nolan presented to a group before you got here, certainly, but as you were looking at those two reports, how can you be confident that that piece of it is it going to be a problem for the MCOs in the future and eventually a problem for taxpayers and for us in the future? I'll try to answer your question, uh, several parts to that. I, I think one of the things that, that I'm confident in is that we have a process in place as we go through and develop these rates. And when I say that, we have uh, collaboration between not just the MCOs and IME and our actuaries and that always doesn't occur. Sometimes there's a contentious relationship between MCOs and actuaries and MCOs and the Medicaid program. And when I came here, that's not something that I wanted to move forward with. We still have to be transparent. We still have to develop rates based on what's best for the state of Iowa. And that means having accurate, complete data. If we don't, why, where do we go get it? It means having the MCOs complete additional financial templates so we can get the information that they say they've paid and do that comparison to the encounter data, do the comparison to the submitted financial statements. And all those comparisons are not just done in the aggregate. It's done by category of service. So you're taking a look at inpatient, outpatient, physician, ER, pharmacy, taking a look at all those costs and making sure that they're in, um, not exact, you're never gonna get exact, but they're within an acceptable range of all those different sources. Um, so I'm confident in that process. I'm confident that when I took a look at the Milliman report and kind of how that process worked, I think there were assumptions made that were incorrect. Uh, that's just my opinion and that's what you asked. So uh, I think there were some incorrect assumptions. Um, I have told the actuary that I want to make sure we develop these rates based on members and the services that we provide these members based on what the data tells me. I don't have a number in mind. I want you to tell me. Once we get to that base rate, which we did, then we can start looking at assumptions, trend, for example, and you can have some movement. But once you get to that base rate development, and that's based on an actual experience, you cannot then go in and say, no, I need to reduce these by this percentage. Because as I said earlier in the presentation, it's not budget driven. So that's why I'm confident in how we're moving forward with developing the rates on an ongoing basis. Right. Um, in one of the very first oversight meetings, uh, I asked the three leads of the MCOs, at what point will, will we know we're successful? And what does that look like? And so Director Foxhoven brought up that fee-for-service move to managed care. We're looking for better outcomes. Even within, you know, the MCOs have a lot of money to be able to do their own actuaries. So, so when I ask, when will we know we're successful from moving to a fee-for-service to managed care, what criteria do you think, or do you think we're there, or we're close, or um, instead of this being just an experiment, how can we make sure that we're getting better outcomes? Well, I think it really goes back to what your definition of success is. Um, that could have a lot of definitions. But from my perspective, when I take a look at this particular Medicaid program, I think you know it's been 11 months um, sat in this Medicaid program, and, and there were some opportunities to do things differently. Um, I really am confident that we're moving in the right direction. I have had many meetings with providers and members uh, we have processes in place, escalated uh, processes to review claims that haven't been paid. We have done a lot in this program from an operation perspective to get us moving forward in the right direction. And the reason we have to do that is because we need to provide services to our members. And I believe we are moving in that right direction. Uh, we have gone in and made an investment in this program. But belief and fact, 
are different. So, so can you show us, can you direct us that patients are actually getting better care? I mean, what, it's one thing to cut the budget and, and use less money per patient or per member, but are they getting better care? And how do we see that? How are you going to prove that to us, that they're getting better? Well, I think that, you know, again, what do you mean by better care? Are they going to the doctor more? Yes. Primary care physician visits, they're going to the doctor more. Is there less ER utilization? Yes. So is that how we define getting better care? I believe so. Well, That's this, happening. And this isn't our idea of the managed care, switching to managed care. So I think the onus is on the department to find out what better care looks like and tell us what that looks like and show, prove to us that the move from fee-for-service to managed care is actually working. So let me, let me just a couple more comments in the sense that we are moving forward in that direction. So, for example, we have those performance measures in place, quality health outcomes for the members. They're not operational. There's a couple operations, but we're moving forward with quality outcomes, health care outcomes, to see the improvement. We need to increase certain well child visits by 3%. We have very specific numbers in there on the performance measures, so that's one component of that. We are seeing utilization going in the right direction from a managed care versus fee-for-service. So those are things like ER, inpatient, primary care physicians are going up, visits are going up, transportation is going up because you want to see though, you want to see some services that are going up and we are seeing that. So those are things that we are seeing and I can say yes, healthcare is getting better for those members by using and looking at that data. Um. Uh, Representative Forbes asked about the admin rates of this year. Could you get us the numbers for 16 and 17 uh, and send those to, so you send want those to the chair? When managed care Under became Under ratio, yeah, for 16 and 17 and the admin uh, rate was 7.3, did you say 7.3? So we'd like the numbers for 16 and 17 as well. I want to make sure we all understand too, when we say that admin rate, it includes about 2% care coordination but put that in the communications. Um, so, Director Foxhoven, if we're moving to a calendar year, have you considered the difficulties around the possibility that we might have to do a supplemental and we won't be here? No, my, my understanding is that we'll have a contract each time before you go. And so we're going to have a contract for that calendar year um, and then we'll know before you come back the next time what the next contract is going to look like. There might be a point at which you would need a, su a supplemental appropriation and that might fall differently than it would for a fiscal year. We'll certainly substantially reduce the chance that we'd have to have a supplemental because we're going to know ahead more ahead of time before you go on. That hasn't been, that hasn't been the problem. That's been the problem in the past with, a, with having a a, a, a contract year that aligns with the state fiscal year, and which doesn't fit well with your calendar. That's all, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, uh, I know we're kind of running out of time here before I finish the next presentation. Uh, one of the questions I guess I have in this process is, uh, Director Lamb, you mentioned earlier about the uh, performance metric fails. Of the, of the MCOs. And I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on that. When you talk about that, are you talking about um, predominantly failures with regards to the members, to the providers, or to the state's expectations? Well, even if it's members or providers, it's still state expectations, but I'd have to go and get the specific performance measures. So it could be that they didn't submit the encounter data in a timely manner, so they didn't meet that metric. It could be uh, any number of, of the other performance measures. I just know that they did not meet 100% of the performance, so they did not receive that withhold. Well, I'd be really curious to find out which of those performance metrics predominantly fail because when they fail in their performance, someone is negatively impacted. And the question is, is it the members who are negatively impacted, islands? Is it the providers who are providing the services and financially then will bear the, bear the burden of either being paid late or being paid less or not being paid at all because of the intricacies of that. Well, let me try to explain too from a performance metric versus a benchmark in a contract. There are certain requirements or benchmarks in a contract. They're meeting those, which would provide that protection for timely payment and those kind of things. Performance withhold is really relative to an enhanced level of performance. So 
as far as those benchmarks that are required within the contract, they are meeting those. So what you're saying is basically that the very minimum quality of service at least they're getting. I said the but benchmark is being met. Which is the minimum quality of service, right? I didn't say minimum quality of service. Well, it's the it's minimum, minimum that we have required, and then we've listened to you, and you've told us elevate your requirements on payment and some of those things, which we've done and we'll be talking about the next session. But So you're right, it's the minimum what, what we require, not the minimum, not what some people would call minimum care. We, we require more than minimum care. Well, I just want to go ahead and share a story with you because I know that Senator Reagan, for instance, deals with a lot of individuals who are on Medicaid. And, um, uh, and I'll, I'll caveat this. First of all, this was not in the state of Iowa. I was actually someplace else. And I was working with individuals who are in wheelchairs. And while working with the gentleman, he was explaining to me that with the new process of health care, he was unemployed but spent almost all of his time just justifying why he needed a new wheelchair after seven years. And he was able to go through the process and explain exactly what he needed for his expectations and was denied multiple times until he finally got all of the information through and he finally got approved for his product that he needed. By the time he was done explaining to me the process he had gone through, there were three or four other gentlemen and individuals in wheelchairs who were listening intently trying to figure out how they could make it work. Now, this was in California. I realized that the California Medicaid system is different than the Iowa Medicaid system. But the story is still striking, which is we want to make sure that we're not putting substantive barriers in front of individuals who need the services. We want to make sure we're not putting substantive barriers in front of our providers who need to get paid in a timely manner. As these two meetings will go on before the end of the year, I am going to continue to press you on what we can do as legislators to make sure that the members are taken care of, that there's not undue expectations and hurdles that they have a difficult time achieving, especially if they're trying to do things like raise a family, maybe try to get a job, those things, which this time might be extensive for them to get the services they need, and also for our providers so they can continue to grow as businesses and provide those services and the quality services without the fear of bankruptcy and spending an elaborate amount of time trying to get paid for their services. So I just wanted to share that story with you because, to me, that is the theme that I think we should be focused on in the next couple of meetings. Thank and, you. and I think I, I think we've been doing a better job of that. We've tried to rectify that and do that better. There's always going to be this tension. Uh, the same thing happens for private insurance companies. If you have a private insurance company, you, they just don't write a check for everything you ask for. Sometimes they say, I don't think that's medically necessary. If you're in the medical field, you all know what those terms mean. It means insurance isn't going to pay for it. It would be irresponsible for us to just pay for absolutely everything everybody asked for. So what we need to do is, is balance that, make sure that it's necessary, medically necessary, make sure that we pay the right amount, but not too much. It's not fair to taxpayers to pay for something we shouldn't be or to pay more than we should. And that creates tension every time we have to make the decision. And so we need to do a better job. I agree with you totally. And we're, I, I believe we are doing a better job on that. And we've been responding to what you've said. We'll continue to work with you to make sure that we do a good job of balancing that. But to every, I didn't get what I wanted, there's also a, but should you have gotten what you wanted? Because the taxpayer can't afford to give everything to everybody they want. We have to make sure they need it. And, and I appreciate that. And by the way, I totally agree with that sentiment. And so far, what I've heard from the department predominantly, though, is one side of the equation. And so I'm asking you to help us fill in the gaps on the other side of the equation to make sure that balance truly is there. Thank we'll be you. happy to do it. Thanks. And, and, and I really apologize that we're moving close to moving on. Oh. But I want you to have the opportunity to express yourself and ask a question. Okay. Thank, thank you. I'll try to get through my couple of questions uh, quickly then. Um, Director Randall, I kind of want to go back to the um, uh, kind of comment that uh, uh, Senator Mathis had in regard to Optimus and the um, difference of utilizing melanin. And so um, I understand we want to make sure things are actuarially sound. Can you elaborate a little bit as to what wasn't with melanin that is now different with Optimus? I'm just trying to, I want to know what we should watch out for, I guess. And so that future wise, I can ask you some questions intelligently and say, okay, where, where, where are we now that we weren't before? 
Well, I mean, I appreciate that question. I, I, I didn't work with Milliman, so I, I can't go into the specifics as far as what may or may not have been. Um, I can only provide information that was shared with me as far as, because I asked the same questions because I want to make sure we don't repeat that with, with Optimus. But, you know, in all transparency, I worked with Optimus for five years in Kansas. And I thought that we did a very good job in Kansas, and I thought they would do a very good job here in the state of Iowa as well because of the process we went through and that collaboration with the MCOs, Optimus, and the state, you know, and have this, this contentious relationship. But part of it was a lack of data in the sense that there were some, I think, data missing, and I think there were some efforts to um, draw conclusions from other sources that um, probably should not have been used. Um, and I, I think that their assumptions actually potentially were aggressive. So those are a couple things with respect to um, some of the differences. And when I say projections and trend, for example, so you, you have utilization trend, you have unit cost trend. Pharmacy is an extremely important one because that's the highest driver uh, of cost uh, in a Medicaid program as far as increases in trend because you've got so many new high cost drugs coming on the market. And as you know, if it's FDA approved and there's a federal rebate, Medicaid programs have to cover that drug. Okay. And if I, if I can just add to that, you know, I don't want to dump it all on, on uh, Nolan's back. The department's partly responsible for this, too. We didn't give that, we didn't have the data available for them to be able to give us the recommendations that we should have had. And so um, there, there's no question about it that when we brought Optimist in, they said, you need more information. This is what we need and we complied with it. And so part of it is the department's fault. And you know, I'm, I'm willing to accept a piece of that as well, but we should have had uh, the data that they needed to, to really give a better a better number, a better calculation for us. Okay, thank you, Director Farnsfeld, because that's an excellent segue into my next question. Um, that actually goes back to a comment that Representative Heaton made earlier when he was looking at base rates. And again, I understand the difference between for the managed care companies and base rates for the providers. And the providers will say they didn't have all the data that was provided for their rates to be set. Um, I know it was 18 months uh, kind of look back, it was not looking at um, current cost trends for them, and so they feel they, they started out in the negative of sense. So I guess my question is, what are you looking at to address provider base rates or um, I think Director Randy, you mentioned we need some legislation to provide to you to give some direction or to again look back at cost reports. My question would be how far back would you look at those cost reports? I mean, you couldn't look at cost reports right now. You have to go back because providers are already saying we were underfunded to begin with. Let me, let me address a couple of things in that in the sense that um, when you take a look at um, cost reporting, I, I don't think you really need to go that far back. I, I'm not uh, opposed to having providers um, submit cost reports if you truly want to move down that path of looking at increased fee reimbursement. But one thing I want to focus on too, remember Optimus, when they set the 19 rates, they did have historical data, but they also used current data with respect to going through uh, fiscal year 17, which is going to include those costs uh, from those particular members. So, you know, those are the claims that are coming in and what's being paid. So part of that, and, and I can't describe each provider type included, but a significant piece of that is included already in that data. Um, and as far as guidance and legislation, I just want to make sure I, again, emphasize as a Medicaid director, I cannot just increase reimbursement rates. And then my last question is in relation to that 2% pullback, um, where you mentioned that um, the MCOs have not met uh, the performance measures. Can you elaborate that on a little bit? Um, I know one of the areas, um, Director Foxwell, that you mentioned in regards to uh, Senator Chalkern's comment was that they have, um, sounds like they have met, or you've done um, timely payments, or they have met timely payments to providers. I still kind of question that because I think it falls under that quote of both clean claims where they're getting paid but they're just not getting paid the right amount. So could you clarify that? Sure, I'll, I'll clarify at least the payment piece and that is that um, our expected, what we've been hearing from providers and what we've been hearing from you 
is that we expect payment to be better. And I, I expected it from the day I came in. It was, it was bad when I came in as director. It's much better now. We're still not where we should be in terms of payment. And when we get to this next section of discussion, we're going to talk about additions we've made to the contract to enhance the requirements on more timely payment. Uh, and so, and part of that's driven uh, by, by you telling us, uh, you know, we want you to have a contract that includes uh, quicker payment. And let me just real quickly, if I may, as far as performance measures going back, for, for state fiscal year 17, um, they have met majority of those performance measures. And we're still reviewing state fiscal year 18 from a performance measure and a withhold. And, and real briefly, too, when I talked about focusing more on health outcomes, <coughs> excuse me, um, for year three, the performance measures, you know, we still have a couple which are very important from operational, so encounter data and claims processing. So we want timely processing those claims. But then we're also looking at HCBS service plans and requirement um, for 98% of care plans reviewed by the agency shall meet certain requirements. Uh, so that's in there. HCBS member participation in their service planning, that's a performance metric. HCBS employment, increasing employment by 5% for the HCBS members. Well child visits, contractors shall increase rate of well child visits in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth years by 5%. That's a performance measure now. Looking at hospitalization follow-up, um, so contractors shall increase the rate of follow-up after hospitalization and mental illness by uh, 5%. Diabetes testing increasing, reducing ER utilization. So those are some of the measures, that, or the measures that we have in place now as we shift from operational to health outcomes. And we will continue to review what makes sense for the state of Iowa as we move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start again um, and then have Mike give, give you some of the details of the contract. Um, there have been a number of things that we know needed to be built in here that we know we had problems with that you guys alerted us to. You told us we wanted you to make these changes. We did. And that you also told us do more or we'll be back and we expect you to be back. And that's okay. We're, we're, we're glad that you're doing that. Uh, one of them is, is payment, you know, moving up payment and, and getting that quicker. We, we see our, our obligation really to be threefold, and that is, number one, our most important obligation is to our members, to make sure our members get the services they need. And number two, the second one is for our providers to be able to make sure we keep them in business because we can't serve the members if we don't have the providers stay in business. So that's, that's why the payment is an important piece. And number three is we have to be sustainable, and that means respons fiscally responsible to the state. There, there just isn't a bottomless pit. So we need to make sure that we're, as, as the number of people on Medicaid grows, and as the cost of Medicaid grows, that we make sure that we keep it in a level that's sustainable for the state so that we continue to provide those services. As uh, Representative Heath said earlier, we're one of the few states, and we'll talk a little bit later about dental, we're one of the few uh, states that provide dental. We think that's a good thing to do. Again, it's not sustainable if we don't make sure that we do the whole managed care, the whole Medicaid system. We, if we want to make sure we provide all these services to people, we need to make sure that it's sustainable for the taxpayer, that we can afford to pay for it. And so we, we have to do it well. That means be efficient about it, make sure that we don't pay, pay claims that shouldn't be claimed, should, shouldn't be paid, but that we pay those that should be paid and pay them in a timely manner. And so that's really what the focus has been. So we have added money. We've added millions of dollars in the MCO contract uh, for the increased uh, mental health services that are um, going to be included in the bill that you, you passed unanimously last year. Um, we know that basically what we said when that bill was passed is we want the regions to build it and it will be sustained by Medicaid. So we knew that the moment it started, it wasn't going to be a huge cost 
to the state, but that it would be, in terms of sustaining it, we're going to have to pay for it at some point, and that's part of what is in this in this new contract as well. And then finally, we're adding um, some uh, performance measures, and particularly for outcomes and for payment, to make sure that we get payment on time, and Mike will give you some of the specifics about that. Before I get into them about it, I just want to mention just real briefly that, you know, one of the issues that we've been trying to struggle with the whole time is, if, if we talk fiscally, is it saving money? And if it's saving money, how much is it saving us? And, and so the, there was a request. Uh, one of the legislators asked the auditor to do an audit. Um, she spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of CPAs looking at a lot of documents uh, to come up with a decision. When uh, Director Randall first came here about 11 months ago, one of the first things he told me is the way you guys are calculating savings is wrong because you're not comparing apples to apples and there's no way you can figure out whether the savings is correct. And so I told him at the time, and figure out a way to do it correctly so that we can know, is it saving us money or not? And how much is it saving us? And he came up with a methodology um, that, we, that we then put out and calculated it on. The auditor took a look at it and issued a formal report with the, with the CPAs on her staff and said, this is the right methodology. And it saves, what I think she said, $128 million this current year. And so, I think we're past the point of saying, does it save money? And now we can start focusing on how do we improve the health care of islands, how do we make sure payments are made in a timely manner, and how, how do we make sure that we move into a more mature program now of making sure that we really do the right thing in terms of improving outcomes uh, for the people that we serve. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk specifically about <clears throat> what provisions have been added in the new contract, uh, both at your request and um, at at our own decision that it's things that need to be done. Thank you, Director fox -Owen. So, uh, first thing I'll start with is really the contract improvements relative to 2018 and some of the legislative concerns <coughs> we addressed. So, you know, there was language included in the contract relative to the claims reprocessing that was passed. Uh, there was a P4P addressing long-term support service concerns. All those new performance measures I kind of already talked about as far as HCBS, uh, increasing employment and service planning. Uh, looking at the oversight of the program, <coughs> contract improvements for LTSS, which was addressed. Uh, again, service planning requirements as far as participation by members, uh, requirements at minimum, community-based case managers, how often they have to see the members, you know, at least in person or by phone, at least monthly and a face-to-face -face every three months. Um, contract improvements relative to mental health. So. New contracts prioritize mental health services and support to reform that was passed in the 2018 legislation, so language was put into the contract. We updated the contract uh, relative to substance use disorder treatment. You know, the MCOs are required to reimburse all court ordered mental health and SUD for the uh, first three days, so that is in the contract language. We also put language in the contract that the MCOs must work collaboratively with the regions supporting the intensive residential services homes and the access centers that was passed as well so we want to make sure that that language is in the contract there was some new contract language relative to timely payments uh, for providers and for reprocessing the claims i think if you'll recall there's a 30-day for um, claims that are not paid because of a system uh, error or a system configuration issue and then once that's corrected they have 30 days in which to reprocess all those claims and make the payment so that contract language is in there um, there were some revised continuity of care requirements for members, and that really is uh, aligning us with the new managed care rule. There's some very specific requirements from continuity of care for our members. Uh, again, I talked about the other performance measures that are in the contract relative to well child visits and behavioral health. Children's behavioral health system, so there's children's board strategic plan recommendation that's not yet in the contract, but whatever comes out of that will become part of the contract as well, whatever's needed needed to become part of that contract. <clears throat> uh, the new MCO, Iowa uh, Total Care, obviously um, begins July 1st of 2019, so we are onboarding. And, and whatever we put in the contract of the two existing MCOs, it's the same language in the contract of the new MCOs coming on board. Um, so we want to make sure we're consistent across the Medicaid program for as much as possible fee for service and all three MCOs. So whatever it's for the two, the other one will, will have it contract as well um, the onboarding is occurring right now you know we're kind of incorporating and one of the messages I've sent to, to Iowa total care is let's let's make sure we learn 
lessons from past. So let's make sure that as we onboard, uh, we can ensure provided payment, timely and accurate member interaction. So uh, I believe we've been working very well with them. We have weekly meetings with them during this onboarding process. They're beginning to build a provided network because we have a signed contract with them. Um, and part of the contract too is member distribution. Um, I won't go into all the specifics, but we do have a plan in place to distribute membership once the MCO as we go forward with the three. Um, the goal was to, to, to minimize disruption. I can't completely eliminate disruption of the members, but we did consider uh, some of the lessons learned from the past that, that I wanted to inject into the contract language and, and how we distribute the population is that I, I want to make sure there's minimum number of members for the MCOs from a sustainability perspective, but I also want to make sure there's a maximum. So I don't want them to have a, a large percentage of any, any one single population. And then we have some of the challenges we had with the previous MCO. So there's language restricting that percentage uh, as far as how many they can have. Um, but there were groups that we wanted to, to at least allow the opportunity not to be disrupted. So there's about 140,000 members that we're not going to assign them through the auto algorithm. They will still have choice, but we're not going to put them into the algorithm to, to assign them. And those will be like pregnant women, for example, and they currently have a relationship with their doctor and we don't want to disrupt that, so we want that to continue. Um, individuals with very serious illnesses, so cancer, hemophilia, they have those relationships as well, and so they may even have relationships with um, some case managers. Members who have transitioned from uh, facility to home or community-based services, we want to make sure that we don't disrupt that. But again, I want to emphasize that they will still have choice. If they choose to change, they can, but I'm not going to move them. And those are some of the highlights of some of the changes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, appreciate the information on that. I guess um, when you were highlighting the priorities of the members, providers, and then the fiscal responsibility side of it, um, currently, who are the advocates? So if a, if a member has a concern, feels like they have a service that should be provided, it's not being provided, um, and they feel like they haven't gotten anywhere with talking to their provider, who is their advocate? Who can they contact in the department that actually speaks up for them and says, will do these reviews, so maybe maybe uh, facilitates them getting to your desk in order for you to review, <coughs> in order for them to review getting the process done. So, so who works with them in that process? You know, what I tell you is that we've tried to take the attitude of there's no wrong door. And so whether they contact Mike or me or a provider and the provider reaches out or, or a legislator or the governor's office or whatever, we do have a process for that. Mike can talk about the process. But if they miss the process and don't go it, there's no wrong door. If somebody's not getting the services they need, we're gonna take a look at it. I know you guys have gotten a lot of emails. If you think you've gotten a lot of emails, your email ought to be jfoxhov at dhs.state.iowa. Because I get a ton of them about it, and we address every one of them when I get them. And so, so um, I'm gonna have them talk about the process, but I just want you to, to be assured there is no wrong door. If somebody reaches out and says, I'm not getting the services they need. We're going to make sure it gets to the right place, and we're going to do everything we can to fix it. So, so from a member perspective, effectively, it's whoever they can reach out to, legislator or department or anyone else. I, but is there a specific area that ex it's an expertise? Like, for instance, there an ombudsman specifically for that individual or specifically for members who they can go to who do this day in and day out so they understand the process? I mean, as a legislator, yeah. I realize there's a lot of different roles, responsibilities, Depends on what time of year it is, whether someone's in session, not in session. So I'm just wondering if there's if there is a pipeline that's more effective or more efficient or has more knowledge than going to your legislative director. There is, and I'll have Mike go through that with you. I just wanted you to know that if they don't hit that pipeline, they still got access. Right. We're still gonna we're still gonna work for them. Uh, there, there are a couple different avenues, so it just really depends on the the member and what exactly their concern is. So you know there are um, their ombudsman, so they have ability to reach out to that particular person. Uh, we have in Medicaid member services, so they can contact member services and ask their questions. Uh, each of the MCOs has the same type of availability for the member. Uh, they can certainly go out if, if, if it's a long-term support service member, for example, they have access to the community-based case manager, so that individual will be able to refer to whatever the 
uh, issue might be and, and the individuals they need to contact with. So there are a number of different avenues in which that member has. So that was your number one priority. Number two priority was the providers. Same question about the providers. How do the providers go forward to say, hey, I've got a concern, um, you know, I, we bill legitimately for X dollar amount, we were given 80%, we'll take it or leave it. Who do we talk to? Again, I'll tell you, I'll turn over him to process, but there's no wrong door. I get tons of comment, uh, contacts from providers as well that we try to resolve uh, and, and try to make it work. But he's also created this process improvement group to bring providers in to say, okay, what's going wrong? What can we fix? What are structures so you don't have to come to us individually? And I'll have you talk about the other process for that. Multiple avenues as well. And, you know, one of the things, there are provider relations that we have. So there's dedicated uh, relation members uh, who the providers can call about the particular issue. Uh, when I first got here, a couple of months after, we had the opportunities with the claims and the timeliness and the accuracy. So uh, we implemented an internal process, escalated review process. So those emails, uh, and I think I said it more than once publicly, email me, contact me, give me the information. So we've gone through that process. We continue that. So my. Uh, bureau chief, uh, MCO bureau chief and her team, we resolve each and every one of those until satisfaction. The MCOs have their provider relations and their staff as well that the providers can go to. Can you get me or the, this group the actual number and contact person for sure. anyone who might reach out to legislators to say this is the person you should talk to because that's the one they handle, that they're in charge of this? Sure, we'll do that. So there's a person and an industry that we can go through that's the primary one. I appreciate that there's multiple, but a primary industry. Uh, and, and that might be the a representative of the MCO, it might be one well, of Well, I'm assuming that the providers already worked with the MCO and it's failed. So I'd like to understand who they can work through the department sure. to say, hey, listen, I felt like I tried to work with the MCO, I didn't get the, the satisfaction that we think we deserve. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right now, just go process. through me. Right. And that's what I've said before in the escalate review process. You send the email to me, but I need the specifics because we will go through and we will resolve that. Sure. And we will making sure I'm holding both the MCO and the provider accountable. So sure. send me the information. No, I Please. appreciate that because that, that answers a lot of questions for people who have questions for legislators. And I say that to anyone this is the here. Person who wants to I think I've said it before. Um, the next thing I have is a different question on this process. Um, I have been contacted a lot in the last couple of years regarding expenses associated with schools, uh, with regards to law enforcement, with regards to different areas, where we seem to be having an influx, especially from the Illinois area, of individuals coming in with expectation of services relatively quickly. Um, that's usually in housing and some other areas that we have some concerns with. When we talk about the cost associated with Medicaid um, you know, and, and Iowa, do we have it broken down to the natural growth with regards to citizens who've been here for quite a while versus new individuals coming into the state, whether they're transitioning in from other states? Um, do we understand what our costs <coughs> associated with each of those different categories are? I don't know if we have it broken down by length of stay, for example, within the state of Iowa. It's just residency would be within Iowa. I don't know if we track the information if, if they came from Kansas or Missouri or Illinois. We can certainly go back and I'll have to take a look at the eligibility system and what specific data elements we do track to see if that's something that we can actually have data and can do any kind of analysis on. The only reason I'm wondering about that is because I believe that at a certain point, if it looks like that um, Iowa, because of our more generous um, services, is getting what I would call, uh, I don't know, uh, social, social benefit tourism, where someone has run out of benefits in one state, comes to Iowa for their benefits, and then stays only for a short period of time to leave, it's something we might be able to work with the federal government on trying to reconcile, at least try to understand how that process works, because I, I do believe that's happening, at least in eastern Iowa. I don't know about the rest of the state but we're seeing it directly from a lot of areas in Israel. We'll look to see if, if, if we have that data. I mean, we, we verify that they are residents so that they qualify, um, but whether we're able to determine how long they've been resident, I don't know, so we'll check and be able to get back to you on that. I, I do, I do want to just say that when it comes to, to eligibility for Medicaid, that's the department. That's not the MCOs. That's the department that determines eligibility. No, I realize so, that, and I appreciate yeah. that. And, I, and I'm not saying that we should ever deny anybody who comes to the state of Iowa the medical, you know, medical necessity. Um, it's just that we don't have a real clear definition of what I would consider to be citizenship with regards to, um, you know, my understanding is if someone's here six months in a day and they pay the taxes in Iowa, then they're considered to be at least from a tax basis a citizen of Iowa versus someplace else. At least almost no one's I know in Florida tell me that. Um, and from the other side of it, though, I don't know how that works with someone who's bouncing back and forth from Illinois trying to collect benefits from both states. Okay. I'm going to have to interrupt here because we've got a couple. 
more people and we're behind schedule now. But I think what you want to know is what is the federal law as to whether or not when a person comes into another state, can you deny them Medicaid services? If they meet the I don't think you can. If they meet the eligibility requirements, no, you cannot. No. There are certain restrictions relative to time, but and it varies by state. Assuming they're a citizen. They Correct. Have to be a citizen. Well, I know, yeah, it's yeah. a citizen of the United States. Yeah. You can go across state borders and you're going to get your Medicaid service. If you become a resident. Because if they are a resident and they qualify for Medicaid, they qualify for Medicaid. So I want to move on to two more uh, <clears throat> questions. Uh, representing Edens. I have Edens, Fry, and Mathis, and I have five minutes. We'll go a little bit longer than that, but I don't think, because we're going to have to travel for lunch, that hour is very quick. So, Representative Edens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director Randall, so you talked about the assignment of individuals and not wanting to have some disruption, and I certainly appreciate that. Um, I'm just wondering a little bit more, I, I, I guess it's kind of a hard question to ask, because you've got a new contract, a new MCO that's coming in. Are you kind of planning, uh, or have a percentage or thought of that there's just going to be a large amount of individuals who are going to say, you know, nope, we don't want that new assignment, we want to stay with who we are and how that's going to balance out? Um, my question comes from, I mean, since the announcement of going to managed care from our people service system. I mean, I started my sixth case manager, and I can tell you if I was reassigned, I'm not gonna start a seventh. It's not only hard on my son, but it's hard on me as the parent and guardian. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit of what your plans are. Um, you know, I think that was kind of a, an issue with, or part of an issue with AmeriHealth is that a large group, large group sign up with them and not as much with the other. I can just say from some of the families I've spoken to, they're like, well, I don't care who I'm assigned to, I'm going to make sure I'm staying with who I currently am at. Yeah, I think that, you know, part of um, the concern, I have the same concern, and it's not an exact science, because at this point, I don't know what members may or may not do. I, I can't make that decision for them, so we will be monitoring that very closely uh, as far as the choice and the assignment and looking into percentages I talked about earlier. If there are circumstances in which a potential uh, individual who has a case manager gets moved and really wants to move, we, we, we would allow that, or if they don't, we're not going to force. Uh, we have to take a look at each, each individual case because I understand the disruption and the change. You don't want six or seven. I, I can certainly uh, appreciate that. So we'll work through that, um, and I'm hoping that we've, we've thought about everything. I'm sure I haven't but there will be things come up that we'll have to make decisions at that point in time. Um, one of the things I'm also concerned about is making sure risk across all three MCOs is, is as equitable as possible. So we're going to monitor that as well from an acuity perspective. And then in July, we'll, we'll kind of take a, a, a look at where are we. We'll, we'll do kind of and, and see where we are against the percentages by population and then make decisions or changes that we may have to at that point. And if I can just add to that, you know, we, to a certain degree, the reason the federal government requires choice is because they want members to vote with their feet. You know, if an MCO doesn't serve well, that the patient has the right to say, I'm going to go over to the MCO that does serve better. So that's part of how you drive the MCOs to do well, number one. And number two, if people are really dissatisfied, they should exercise that right to vote with their feet. I, I appreciate that, and I appreciated your comment about no wrong door, people are having challenges, whether it's the provider or the individual. I think my frustration comes is usually people have gone through all those, they've gone to the ombudsman's office, they've contacted DHS or worked with their case manager and still are not getting resolution, and so they come to us, and it takes us to kind of get uh, the fire under the feet to get things resolved. Um, that's still a frustration. My last question is, and actually goes to AmeriHealth, so our old, um, you know, previous had a contract with. My understanding is I think there was about $13 million that was still trying to be addressed for providers that were owed to providers. Do you have a status report as to where that is at? I, I don't have a status report, no. Could you get that and provide that? Certainly. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, bye. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Real quick question. We talked about rates this morning. We now are talking about new contracts. And uh, we provided in last year's budget increased funding for mental health, tiered rates, and uh, uh, home health. The new contracts, yes or no, reflect those increase, increases that were provided by the legislature. Any increase that was provided by the legislature last year is in the current, they are in the current cap rate. Yes, you. you're welcome. Senator Mafford. Okay, I'll make it quick. Um, just kind of going back to the first discussion about um, Milliman and Optimus. So, so you've worked with Optimus in Kansas before, and we were talking about your confidence. And Correct. Your, okay. When you chose Optimus here, was there an RFP process? Were there other um, actuarial services that you looked at, or how, how did you select Optimus? We went through, there was not a RFP process um, initially. So during that short period of time, I believe, and I don't have the exact dates, but I think it was through maybe October, there was um, a contract with them. Then we went out to formal RFP. So that relationship has gone through a formal RFP process. All right. Um, and then in the way back talk when we were first talking a couple years ago about um, kind of the, uh, the geo selection, right, um, of taking, you know, the geo location, uh, the automated uh, selection process of putting certain patients with different MCOs at the beginning, how, how they selected who was going to go with which MCO. The algorithm that they went through? Yes, the okay. algorithm. They, um, they did a 30, 30, 60, 60, so 30 minutes, 30 miles to a primary care physician, 60 miles, 60 minutes to a, a specialist. Is that still in consideration? Is that part of some of the reasoning that goes by, goes with the selection? That is, I believe, still part of the algorithm. Okay, so no, I'm being told not for this particular round, no. Can you be more specific about how you're working with providers who are under contract about reducing some of their hundreds of thousands of dollars of payments not met yet? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little brief um, of, of the last seven, eight months of kind of what we've gone through. Um, as I first started, I told you we had the escalate review process. You know, all I heard was providers are not being paid, providers are not being paid, they're owed hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So I said, okay, let's, let's figure this out. So as we went through this process, each and every time I said, email me the information. And so we got the claims information, the very specific information. We sat down with the MCOs, the MCO Bureau, and that team went through each and every one. Their majority of the resolution, there were some provider challenges. I'm not saying it was all providers, but a lot of it was filing claims for members who weren't eligible for Medicaid, uh, missing the timely filing requirements, uh, not getting a prior authorization. I work with the MCOs and I said, I'm going to hold both of you accountable. So I said, let's be reasonable. Let's have common sense here. So if there was an opportunity that maybe this provider went back and forth several times with your provider relations and there was some miscommunication or misinterpretation, if we can pay it, pay it. And so that was what I stated. And we've done that as well. There have been several, I would say probably six or seven meetings where we bring in the MCO plan presidents, I bring in the provider, I bring in myself and my bureau chief, and we sit down and we don't leave that room until we figure it out and we have a project plan in place. And so we've done that and we will continue to do that. So that's why I feel confident we're moving in that right direction because I am hearing less and less and less. That's not the true, oh, the only gauge, but I am really hearing less and less and less and getting less emails. And um, <clears throat> after Auditor Wasserman did her audit, do you know if these the unpaid claims were folded into uh, her audit or not? I, I don't know how the uh, unpaid claims were actually uh, reviewed within that audit. I, I read the report, but I didn't look at all the working papers, so I don't know. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation on the contract. So now we're going to move to the dental wellness program. And I think that both of you are going to be talking to us about that also. 
you want to start with anything, or you want to start? I'm right or wrong? Start. I got to get. You know, maybe I'll just maybe I'll just say one thing before Mike starts, and that is the the, the dental program particularly is one I think that is just a classic example of what we've been talking about of trying to take our program and move it up in terms of making sure that we get good services and improve the health of our people. Because one of the things that we did in the new contract and one of the new dental contracts is to make sure that people were getting preventive care. And that if, if uh, a provider wasn't meeting a certain level of preventive care that they needed under the contract to elevate the percentages of their patients that were coming in for preventive care because in the end that, we know that's better. That's why most of us go and get our teeth clean and get our fillings in and we don't go in just for root canals. And so this is just kind of a classic example where we walked in under the contract and said, look, there's not enough preventive care going on here. You need it. If you're going to get fully paid, you need to elevate uh, the amount of preventive care. It otherwise would be cheaper for them not to be doing it. Now, why would they reach out to people and say, hey, you don't have an appointment, you ought to come in. You know, That's going to elevate their costs. On the other hand, we want the preventive care. And so that's just an example, I think a great example of how we take a look at performance and say, what can we do to improve the health of our members and change the contract accordingly. So Mike, go ahead with that. Thank you. So as you know, I think it's been said, Iowa is one of only 13 states that really have dental program for the Medicaid members. There are about 300,000 members receiving dental services in the state of Iowa. There are two plan administrators, so you have uh, Delta Dental of Iowa and Managed Care of North America, known as NCNA. Uh, the inception of the dental wellness program was really going back to January 2014, when they implemented for the Iowa Health and Wellness, or the expansion population. May of 2014, the dental wellness, wellness plan was created to provide innovative dental benefit structure. And then July of 17, the dental wellness plan amended to expand the program to all Medicaid enrollee, enrollees above the age of 19. There were uh, healthy behaviors or part of that uh, requirement, that dental program. So that was implemented in July of 2017 when they brought the entire Medicaid population in for those adults. The members must complete those two healthy behaviors each enrollment year to maintain the full benefits and not pay a premium. Uh, those healthy behaviors really are oral health self-assessment, filling out the self-assessment and one preventive dental visit. If they don't complete those healthy behaviors in that year, then the following year they'll have $3 a month premium that they have to pay. Uh, we also implemented in September of 2018 a $1,000 annual benefit maximum. It applies to Medicaid adults. Uh, it's really needed as Dr. Director Foxhoven talked about sustainability in the program. It brings that program in line more with some commercial and even state employee health program relative to annual benefit maximums. We were also cognizant and we worked with the providers and the dentists and understood that, hey, there's sometimes, you know, we want to make sure we don't apply that annual benefit max to certain services. So we did exclude uh, preventative type services. We want to make sure they go to the dentist for those preventative services. So exams for cleanings, x-rays, fluoride, and certain anesthesia are not part of that annual benefit max. So that's not included. The emergency dental services will never be included as part of that annual benefit max. Any of the codes that are excluded are clearly indicated on our website. One of the concerns that we met with providers too is, okay, I'm gonna make sure I get paid or I don't provide a service and they're already at their annual benefit max, so how am I gonna know, right? So we worked with them. There's a daily transfer of file of information. So we have a file transfer. Um, they can actually go into the, the, our website in, in our system and actually see what the current, where they are relative to the ABM. So if they're at $800 and you know, they know they can't perform a root canal, they're gonna have to try to do something else. So that was one of the concerns that we addressed as well. So they have timely information. But what we told them is for that to be accurate, for you to go into our system be able to see that, you have to file your claims timely. Because if you don't, then we're, we're not gonna know, our system won't know. So Mr. Chairman, that would be the update for the dental program. I've got a, in my visit to the general college up there back in 2014 and 2015, I remember when we implemented our dental wellness program and had them, we approached it from a dental home point of view. And as my, what they told me at the dental school was the rapid sign of dentists who were willing to provide services 
to our Medicaid population. We haven't seen that for years. In fact, it was, it was an embarrassment, really, to see the difficulty that our Medicaid-eligible children and our adults how they could get access to dental care, and so I thought that we had a problem solved. Could you tell me now, then, since you've made your changes to that dental wellness program that originally started in 2014, have you seen fewer dentists as a result of your changes, or are they remaining the same? I personally have not seen a reduction or know of a reduction in dentists relative to the changes we've made. I do know that we have network adequacy requirements with both of those plans, so we monitor that um, uh, closely. Uh, I do believe there probably are a shortage of certain uh, professionals and dentists in certain areas, but we, we continue to monitor that uh, to make sure certain members get the services they need. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate you both coming and talking about the dental wellness plan because I don't think a lot of people realize that it is under Medicaid uh, now and what's available. Um, so it kind of goes into, I know you want to see that increase in preventing, I'm sorry, I have a cold. Me too. Getting over that or um, addressing um, having increased preventative care, and that they're following up and maintaining those healthy behaviors, which address the premiums. Um, but I haven't seen, except for you coming today, no reports on the dental wellness plan. And I'm just wondering, I'm assuming you're getting reports from um, uh, Manchester North America and Delta Dental. Um, I would like to see or have you provide us those reports, um, have it part of our, the Manchester quarterly reports. Um, I mean, if that's, I, there just doesn't seem like a lot of transparency if this was created in 2014. It's 2017 of when you, uh, you know, expanded there, and now we're almost going into 2019, and this is really kind of the first conversation we've had on that. So that's just something I'm going to request, that that is oh. part of your quarterly reports to us. Absolutely. I have no issue with that whatsoever. We, what we will do is we'll go back and probably not this quarter, but the next one because we'll have time to kind of develop what we feel you might want to see and then we can get feedback and, and go from there. I think that um, we have no issues or challenges with, with sharing that information. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Right. Um, they certainly don't want to get to a point where we're legislating, um, having reports, um, but I do think that we don't have enough transparency in our dental program for legislators to know are we making any um, changes in the program Certainly. or not. So thank you. Representative Lundgren. Thank you. Um, just a quick question, and I don't know if this is the appropriate time or not, but um, recruitment of dentists, we have an issue in our area, um, Dubuque County. Um, what are we doing as a department to help recruit dentists and, and get them the information that it is a, a Medicaid covered service and it's not difficult for them to navigate the system because that's the conversation that I've had with dentists in my area in the past. And a lot of them are just taking these patients in and doing the right thing, but not um, you know, billing Medicaid for the service because they think it's too cumbersome. So with the changes, how do we see that changing? Well, I, I think um, one of the things, and, and I'll go back to what Representative Heaton said, I, I too went out to the College of Dentistry about two months ago and got a two and a half, three hour tour and met with the dean and got to walk around and see what they do, which was very interesting and I appreciated that. Um, he talked a lot about the efforts to recruit there's one college of dentistry in this state, and he talked about the number of slots. And he also was very impressed about the the, percent, the high percentage it stayed within the state of Iowa, which was at that point significantly high. Um, so, you know, I, I believe that from my perspective, we have to continue to look at the the number of providers in the network and adequacy of that network. I'm not aware of any specific recruiting efforts that the state Medicaid program has relative, but we do have, you know, communications on an ongoing basis with both of the dental plans. We meet with them on a regular basis. We have provider communication that goes out with respect to changes in the dental program or what's available. The information is all available on our website. And but you know, we can take a look at how we can potentially communicate that better to the provider network. 
Well, and specifically, maybe I wasn't, I wasn't probably specific enough. It's, it's really more recruiting dentists that are already operational in the state of Iowa into the Medicaid program to accept Medicaid patients. One of the things we did in this contract is that we take a look at a lot of data, to your point, and one of the things I saw with one of the uh, MCOs providing services was their penetration rate, significantly less than the other and significantly less than the national average, basically. So wrote into the contract that they must increase that significantly over the next two years. So that in itself is going to drive more members to those providers. And so, uh, but we will also take a look at the other opportunities from the communication perspective. You know, Director Fox over mentioned the process of a working group. We did have the dental uh, part of that. Um, so they were involved in that process as well. Thank you. Thank you, Director Randall. I remember when we first met and we <laughs> talked about the dental program. You said Kansas didn't have one, and so Iowa does. So I, I guess, how committed are you to the dental program? And at what point will you look at it and say, this might be on the chopping block and we're going to cut it? I mean, I, I think we'd like to know that as legislators, and I come from a bias, I really think that dental health is a, is a key, it's a portal into a person's physical health. Um, so I, I just want to see if you're committed or not, and if, if and when that comes up, who makes that decision if we will keep the dental uh, program or not? Well, certainly I'm committed to providing services to the members of the state of Iowa, 680,000 including dental. So I will continue to do what I do to ensure those services are provided. Uh, with respect to dental, it is an optional service, as you know, because only 13 states have it, it's not mandated. Um, and I don't think there's any one person who would make that decision if it came to that. Uh, I think you would have to have discussions with a number of different individuals relative to, is that the right thing to do? Uh, what are the alternatives? So that would be a whole process. Uh, so I think that would be more than one individual. I would tell you, from my perspective, that would come from you, from the legislature, because in my opinion, it, it's part of the Medicaid program right now, and if the legislature said, we aren't going to give you enough money to run this program, then we'd, we'd have to come to you and say, what are, what are our options? You know, I'm not going to not buy a wheelchair for somebody so somebody can get their teeth cleaned, probably, okay? But you're going to have to make that decision. I think, I think frankly... Uh, one of the unappreciated jobs that you have is developing priorities for the resources that, that you allocate. And so if you don't allocate enough money for us to sustain the Medicaid program offering the services that we have now, we'd have to come to you and say, these are the choices you have of what services you would have to eliminate to be able to meet the budget you're giving us. That would be my decision. Director Foxova, forgive me for being suspicious, but we didn't have any choice in the managed care organization switch. from from fee-for-service to, to a huge $5 billion payout for managed care. You know, that's, that's a lot of money. So, uh, you know, I think we just need to keep a line of communications open about it. Um, from, from my perspective, and I think I speak for several here, you know, uh, we want to see the dental program continued. We want to make it work. And Representative uh, Lengren, you, you um, make a great point in, what's our role in trying to recruit dentists into the Medicaid system because the very first letter I ever got was from a dentist. This was back in 2015, in the fall of 2015, before we even had um, people you know, uh, signing up. Um, she said, I'm sending out a, a letter to 250 of my Medicaid patients. I'm not going to do it. She said, I'm just not going to do it. I've seen what happens in other states. I'm not going to handle it. Now in Marion, one of the cities that I represent, there is one dentist left that takes Medicaid patients. The other one retired, and upon retirement, he called me and he said, I can't balance this. There's a tipping point. The reimbursement is too low, or what, whatever it was, um, a lot of patients went to him because there were a lack of services to spread around to other dentists. So, um, so, so I, I just want to let you know from my perspective, we would want to encourage that, um, the dental Medicaid program. I just want to concur with Senator Mathis in the conversation I had with the dentist from Fairfield. He's the only one in town that would take Medicaid. 
and uh, he's going to retire in these days. He's very concerned about what are these people going to do for access to health care. I mean, if you, if you want to encourage dentists to provide care to our Medicaid patients, the reimbursement rate, or whatever was right with the 2014 I would encourage the department to consider a return to what we had rather than to what we have now, because I don't think that our dentists are overly interested, unless they work for an MQAC, to provide that kind of care. Representative Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, also had discussions with dentists in the Des Moines area. You know, it's, it's all boils down to reimbursement. Um, I've been told that, you know, they're getting maybe 30 to 40 percent of their normal fee when they pr perform services like that cleaning of teeth and things like that. They just can't afford to uh, to offer that service or provide that service at the rate that uh, they're reimbursed. So I think, and then under the Hawkeye program, I know we have more dentists that are in Hawkeye because the reimbursement structure is different for Hawkeye than it is through the Iowa Medicaid program. So I think we need to uh, really study this and look at a way we can make it equitable for dentists here in the state of Iowa to provide services and not you know, lose money when a patient walks into their office. Because I've talked to some of them that do say they, they provide, if they've been a patient of theirs and they go on Medicaid, uh, some of them are providing the service at no charge or very minimal uh, fee just to you know, provide that service. But uh, they, can't, they can only do so much of that. So I think from the legislature, I think we need to really look at uh, a system or a payment system in place that's fair for dentists to be able to provide services for I, patients. I, I totally agree. I think that we, we have done the analysis. We are aware. Um, so I think in early conversations when we began and, and I've had those discussions and trying to bring equity between those two populations. So you're, you're exactly right. I believe that needs to occur. Yeah. So we need, this is something we probably need to address next session in the budgeting process to make sure that, uh, we can provide the services for these people because Dental care, like Senator Matthew said, is so integral to the overall health care of people in the state of Iowa. And, and if I could just comment quickly, there's a reason that we're only one of only 13 states that provides dental care. And that's because other states have said we can't afford to pay for it. So it does go back and you got to decide your priorities for your spending, whether you can afford to pay for an enhanced rate for all the dentists, to, and there's a there's a tipping point where you have to say, do we have enough or not enough? Can we get enough or not enough? And I've certainly had dentists come to me and say exactly what Representative Ford said, which is, you know, I'm getting a third of what I charge my normal people, and I can't tell you how many lawyers call me and tell me I don't even get a third in court-appointed rates of what I charge my normal. We pay $60 an hour for court-appointed lawyers. You've hired a lawyer lately, it's a couple hundred dollars an hour. and so. Uh, that's always the tipping point that we have of how do we sustain the program financially but and get enough dentists willing to make that sacrifice to do that. And when it doesn't, then we'll have to raise more to get it to that point or we'll have to be one of the other 37 states that said we can't afford it. That's the decision the legislature has to make. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you both. Uh, I am me and the department Board today, giving frank answers to our, uh, our discussion here. And we really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have no cafeteria in the building. We know the regular <laughs> drill. Go and grab something. We're going to start at 1 o'clock. Thank you. And we'll see you later. All right.
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Costello, Representative Heat, and fellow members of the committee. My name is Jeffrey Jones, and I am the plan president for Amerigroup Iowa. Uh, for those of you that were expecting the pearls today, as you may be aware, Cynthia McDonald has taken a new role in our organization, um, and I rose to the role of plan president uh, earlier this year. Uh, Cynthia actually has accountable for multiple accountability for multiple markets now, including Iowa, which has helped to ensure a very seamless and continuous members, a leadership transition. Um, I'd like to provide a little more detail about my background, but we'll preserve that for the MCO update portion so we can keep through moving through this section. Um, turning to value-based purchasing, um, first I'd like to talk a bit about where we've been in 2018, describe what some of our efforts have been, and then the second component of my presentation, I'd like to talk through and describe the types of programs we utilize at Amerigroup uh, to advance the value-based initiatives that are set upon us by CMS and our state partners. Uh, so first, for 2018, our, our strategy has been very, very focused on ensuring that we are expanding and transitioning away from the sole use of a unit cost, solely unit cost based fee for service model in which fees are paid for services and instead transitioning into an outcomes based model in which incentives are paid for value that is represented by improved health outcomes and quality of services delivered. Our efforts have been aligned with our state contract and the expectations of the department and the IME, and our target for the year was set at a minimum 40% by year end of members that are attributed to a provider that is in a value-based arrangement, and uh, I can say that Group is absolutely on track for that goal for this year. Um, moving into the types of programs, fundamentally we have two main uh, uh, categories, if you will. The first is our quality incentive programs, and the second is our shared savings arrangements. And so I'll talk about the quality incentive programs first and describe to you the differences between the different types and how we target and how we utilize those. Um, from a quality incentive program pr uh, perspective, it's a very adaptable, flexible measurement tool that the real key is, is flexible and adaptable <laughs> by provider type. And so we can mold these quality incentive programs based on a targeted population, uh, if you will. Um, currently, we have quality incentive programs in place for primary care physicians, both large and small, uh, nursing facilities, and personal attending care. The nursing facility and personal attendant care quality programs were pilots that we initiated last year and ran into this year uh, that were a first of their kind, not just for Iowa, but for our organization as well. And again, it, it, it was a move to ensure that we are trying to find innovative ways to target a broader pro provider base than what may be traditionally targeted for uh, historical quality and set of programs, uh, if you will. And some of our results from those include for our nursing facility 
program. And first, I should say our pilot providers of both programs, both the nursing facility and the personal attending care, did achieve and did earn uh, a payout as an incentive, if you will. It did, did achieve their targets to some extent. So uh, for nursing facility, uh, the, the provider we leveraged and utilized there earned an upside bonus payment by demonstrating lowered inpatient remissions. And they achieved those lower readmissions by higher quality of care coordination post discharge. And for our personal attendant care provider, they earn an upside bonus payment by exceeding their member satisfaction goals and by demonstrating based on their actual member feedback that the care they are delivering to their members is meeting and exceeding their needs. Looking forward to 2019, we're going to be continuing to expand in our quality and set up programs. Both of those two pilots I just mentioned will be ready for a broader launch across our entire network of providers. And we're also going to be introducing several new offerings as well. And so uh, for those that have some, some familiarity with these types of programs, some of these areas are not traditionally what we may talk about in managed care. Um, they include obstetrics, it's, it's fairly traditional, but behavioral health, psychiatric residential treatment for minors and substance abuse of providers. And so we have identified opportunities with each of those provider types, again, to target the right opportunities for them to continue to improve health outcomes for their members and for us to incentivize those accordingly. The second category of value-based uh, arrangement that we talked about is uh, our shared savers, shared savings agreements. A little tongue-tied, I apologize. Um, these are agreements that typically are created to meet the needs of larger providers, very often hospital systems, but not only. Um, and, and, and typically there are providers who are operating with their own sophisticated information systems, and they have their own care coordinated infrastructure to some extent, uh, that have an interest in sharing a little more uh, collaboratively uh, the overall outcomes for our membership. Um,
And we also know that we need to focus, and part of our responsibility is to provide focus for those providers to identify where the number of individuals they serve who may need them most. Um, and so we're constantly evolving our tools to fine tune and get even better in that process. Um, um, so value-based care also promotes uh, better health and lower cost. So some of the things that we're seeing as part of our arrangement so far is we're seeing um, increase in follow-up after hospitalization. So we're sharing information with providers around discharges and we're seeing that they follow up after the discharge. Those rates are increasing across our providers. We're seeing the same for emergency rooms. So we're seeing that providers are um, really taking the information, engaging with the information, and they're using it and it's helpful for them in terms of understanding who needs those next touch bases to bring it back into, um, into the care coordination. Um, we're also seeing increased um, engagement on risk, uh, high risk members. Um, so, you know, through our, you know, through coordination with the providers um, and with using our different perspectives and strengths, um, you know, we're identifying lists of individuals who really are in need, in need of assistance and can use additional outreaches. Um, and so, what we're seeing is, you know, both the kind of production and, and dis decision making and discussions around who it is we can help, uh, coupled with the clinical engagement on how do we help those individuals and how do we stay really tightly connected to make sure they're getting those services that they need. Um, we're also seeing um, increases in access to care for members, so we're seeing more members get same day appointments, et cetera, as part of some of this work. So, we're providing both data as well as financial supports um, and resource supports for providers um, to help support them in their efforts uh, for this work. Uh, as part of this also, we're seeing, um, with these relationships, we're seeing really good alignment with the providers. So these discussions around members, around opportunities, around data, around what we're both seeing is creating a lot of closeness between United Healthcare and our providers. So, well, we have monthly meetings with our ACO partners. We've got regular touch bases. We have teams dedicated to supporting our providers in terms of data and information that we're seeing um, and follow-ups related to that. Um, and so, with those daily, you know, with those regular, very regular touch bases, we're deepening our relationships with our providers, um, and so we're having some additional uh, positives come out of that. So, some of the things that we've got um, right now that we've been able to build upon is we have United Healthcare employees. Um, in, in a variety of facilities across the state to help with transitions um, after hospitalization. So um, we've got individuals that are actually in hospitals and facilities working with staff to make sure that our members have what they need for a successful transition out of the inpatient setting. Um, and we also, um, and that's crossing both medical as well as behavioral. So we've got um, SMI members, severely um, mental ill individuals covered as well as individuals with acute hospitalization. Um, so we're seeing some real, real benefits there. Um, I mentioned earlier also, um, you know, we're really kind of um, increasing again that direct engagement on specific lists of members. So um, that's something that we um, have put um, a lot of effort into, and as well as the providers, is really pulling out those individuals who um, need us the most, and, uh, need the providers the most, need assistance the most, and we're really working to direct those resources um, towards those individuals. Um, so I think that's, yeah, in terms of, um, again, uh, just to highlight, you know, we've got our quality contracts in place, we've got ACO value-based purchasing, um, we've got some interest in risk, um, risk arrangements, which we're currently exploring. Um, the process of value-based care is an evolution, though, um, and we're incredibly open to doing it in the way that's most effective for IUN. So um, we, you know, we have resources, we have systems, we have a lot of folks with a lot of experience across the country, but we recognize that we need to do this um, unique to Iowa, and we want to support Iowans. And so when we think about how we move forward um, with these, um, with our value-based care arrangements, um, you know, we really come back to that initial commitment, which is to improve the health of Iowans, to make the system work better, um, to go and engage with our providers in our state. Um, and so that's how we plan to proceed throughout 2019 is continuing, um, you know, continuing that work. Um, we have, you know, given the, uh, we have exceeded the 40% of members assigned to value-based purchasing contractual requirement already. We're at the 48%, as I mentioned. Um, so now we're really just helping, you know, fine-tune, build out, understand, learn, and develop 
on value-based care, continue to develop value-based care that's going to benefit Iowans and benefit Iowa in the long run. So I'm very pleased to be here um, today uh, representing United Healthcare. Um, we're very proud, again, to serve um, the state uh, as part of our health Senator Chilton, you have a question? I do, thank you. <laughs> um, so first of all, I want to come out directly and tell you I, I actually support the value-based healthcare scenario. That being said, I see some big red flags that I'm concerned about. I want to share that with you so that going forward, as you build these things out, you're careful of some things. You know, Iowa is uh, 99 counties, some very small towns. Uh, I happen to represent a county that has uh, no stoplights. So all of uh, Banbury County, I don't believe there's a single stop by the entire county. But there are some very good companies that might only be two or three employees. They're relatively small. And so I hear trigger words, such as risk-based and shared savings, things like that. To me, unless you are a relatively large hospital network, a relatively large company that maybe has um, some other financial backing, maybe there's some financial partnerships with the MCOs directly, I, I assume, the MCOs have potential some ownership, or vice versa, some hospital associations have some ownership into the MCOs themselves, and there's partnerships associated financially between the companies. But some of these small companies, startup companies, don't have that ability. And so they really aren't eligible for the kind of risk that you're talking about. But in some communities, they are the primary individuals. They're the ones that are trying to get that involved. So as we move forward with this, this process, I just want to make sure that we're not forgetting that there are some small companies out there that really care about what they're doing, and I don't want to see them being squeezed out because they're not eligible for these programs. So that's my biggest concern I have in the process, and then asking that as you go forward to make sure that what we're not doing is we're not monopolizing the MCOs with a strategic hospital network, which then is, the work is all funneled towards them because they're so much more efficient in exactly what you want to do it, and we then even start squeezing out the medium-sized vendors because they can't have that stable level of risk either. Um, you know, then you start getting issues of, the state of Iowa has trusted three MCOs, which are all very large corporations, who can handle the risk associated with big losses potentially, but also good profits. I just want to make sure at some point you realize that, that shouldn't be filtered all the way down to these small companies. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much for that feedback. That's incredibly helpful. Um, what I can tell you is that when we think about um, the continuum, um, every provider is different, and every you know providers have different capabilities. Um, and we've got a rural, you know, we've got a state that's largely rural still, so we need to recognize that and support the state in totality. Um, completely, completely agree with that. Um, our goal with value-based care is really to meet providers where they are. So if we've got providers, they've got capabilities that we work with them. You know, our you know our goal is to improve the life of someone who's living in Polk County as much as it is to improve the life of someone who's living in Van Buren. So um, I can tell you that um, that's absolutely something that that we keep in mind. Perhaps we've got again we have models that span from. Um, uh, even other models versus the basic quality model. So there may be some other things that we can think of for those rural counties, and I think that's a fabulous comment, something that we'll definitely take back as we think about 2019. Are there any further questions for the United? Yes. Um, along value-based, um, so you do work with providers, so um, how do you initiate them? Do they come to you? Do you go to them?
all. So um, any opportunities that present along those lines, those are things that we're always having to discuss. And are you open to innovation? Does it have to be Research established. Um, are you are you willing to try some of the things that might not be yeah. in your coding yeah. currently? Yeah. And how do you do that? Yeah, well, we love innovation, right? That's the fun part. I think that's where some of the fun comes in. With the IAB Secures, we have the ability to identify needs and then meet those needs. So you got to answer that question. We're absolutely open to innovation. How we manage that depends on what that opportunity looks like. So you know, what reporting is required, what information we need to collect to report those types of things. How do you operate? And that's where we get into some of the details. Um, but yeah, we are um, we're incredibly, I would say, open if there are items that align with improving quality of care and, and managing costs. Are there any other questions for the lady from the United Thank you very much. Thank you. I look forward to it. So, uh, our next presenter is Lee Point. We're going to get the other side here. Well, great. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, and Sabra Grosner, Government and External Affairs from Unity Point. And I know or have spoken to most of you, and I'm sure you know a lot already about our health system, but just to remind you, we are a large um, integrated healthcare system that has um, hospitals really coast to coast in Iowa and um, 2,000 docs that are um, working for Unity Point at Unity Point Clinics who have a large presence in behavioral health and um, home health care, really the full um, health care continuum. So um, I, there have been different questions about independent providers. Um, we do partner with many critical access hospitals and they're part of our network as well. But I really am here on behalf of the large integrated health system and the viewpoints that I share from that perspective, so I wanted to point that out. Um, you know, the words value-based care are just thrown around so much, and I know there's confusion, and probably by everyone at this table, because I know that around our senior team table, there's confusion when, you know, it's just such a buzzword, value-based care. So I want to talk a little bit about really what does value-based care mean to Unity Point Health? Um, and maybe put some arms around that definition because I think it'll be really helpful for this conversation going forward throughout session and whenever we deal with this, um, if, if I explain this from the provider perspective. So in, um, on April 16th, 2015, uh, there was a law passed in regard to physician Medicare payment. I did not get off track. This is actually not track. And um, it, it totally changed the way that docs get paid um, in Medicare. And that had a huge impact on Medicaid because what it mandated was that over time, physicians to, to get the same Medicare rates and not get lower Medicaid rates had to take risk. So the discussion of whether we're going to take going to take risk in the future or not is it's really not an option for, for us. I mean, so it's not a will we do it or won't we do it. That's it's already written, it's passed, it's done. It was supported by Senator Grassley and Senator Burns. It was and, and at least bipartisan. It was one of the few bipartisan bills that have been passed overwhelmingly within the last years. So we've been living in this world since 2015. And the value based of, of now is not the value based of 2011 or 2013 or 2014. And what I mean by that is it's not just, okay, um, providers are gonna get some extra money if they meet quality metrics. We're just gonna throw them a couple extra bucks. That's, I mean, and, and that still is done in contracts, but that's not what we're mandated to do under this new law. We are mandated to take responsibility for a group of patients and be responsible not only for hitting quality metrics, but for the total cost of their care. So what is being asked of providers is very much like what you all as the state have asked of MCOs. 
you set targets for them, they have to meet the targets. If they come over the target, I don't think they paid that money, I'm not sure, don't know the contract. But if they come under the, car the target, you know, they share in some of those savings. That, on a smaller scale, next level down, that is what providers are being mandated to do. Now here's the problem and here's where Medicaid comes in. Because what, what the Medicare law says is that we have to have a certain number of all the patients we serve. So like at Unity Point Health right now, we have 100,000 Medicare patients that we're serving in a downside risk country. So those 100,000, we have a big, huge target set for how much their health cost is, and we're trying to come in and do it. It's our second year of doing this. And, but, and so that, that is what's called an advanced APM, alternative payment method under MACRA. That's the law that was passed in 2015. So we're required over time to increase the threshold of patients that we have in those types of arrangements, those risk arrangements. We have to have um, a certain percentage of all the patients we have in those arrangements. We cannot do it with Medicare patients alone. So what the federal law says is you providers need to get into contracts with commercial payers or with Medicaid, and you need to get into the same type of arrangements, and you need to get your threshold of patients up to this level that you have in risk-based arrangements or else your Medicare reimbursements go down. Now I know you all know that in Iowa we're, we're pretty low in our Medicare reimbursement compared to the rest of the country anyway. So I think every Medicare provider in this room is like, well, we can't afford to go down by 4% or 5%. We have to keep at least where we're at. So that's why, from our perspective, we're, we have to enter into risk-based agreements. And we have to do it pretty quickly. The threshold, we already missed the first year that state Medicaid programs could submit their contracts to say that they would qualify for this was this year. And we, we did, or for 2019, and we, none of the contracts in the state qualify right now. So really, we need to look at, at least from Unique Point Health's perspective, getting to a qualifying contract under the federal law for 2020. And I know that's a lot, and it is com it's complex. I mean, we probably need more, for sure, more than 20 minutes to talk through that. But from our perspective, we have to get there because of our Medicare reimbursements. Okay, so so it's all tied together; it's not separate. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I know I, I've just kind of thrown a, a bunch at you. But um, and there's other things, but that's kind of the who, what, where, when, and why. Um, in regard to implementation, I have some targeted things that I can share with you that we're looking for in these kind of what we're calling subcapitation agreements. And I and we're fine to put them out there, they're not a trade secret or anything. Um, and I can go there, but I'd like to pause there because I, I think I put out a lot of content and I'd like to pause for comments, questions, thoughts. So, uh, just thinking about this. Uh, so, you're reimbursed on a capitated rate per patient per month. Is that what that means? For Medicare? For yeah. whatever, for yeah. two, in regard to. So, the Medicare contract we have is directly with the federal government. There's not an in between insurer there. So, it's just Unity Point Health's contract with Medicare. We um, are there. Um, we have a benchmark which is made up of the total cost of care of all the patients, of the 100,000 patients for a year. It's based on their expenditures from the prior year. And, um, you know, we're, we work, we do all kinds of things underneath that benchmark to try to make sure that we're hitting our quality metrics and that we're coming in under that benchmark cost so we can share in the same. So your incentive then is to really work more closely with the patients yes. to reduce health costs and hopefully increase quality of care Absolutely. at the same time. This is how we've developed a lot of the capability that we think um, will prepare us to take risk because we've built up a lot of case management, care management capabilities. We, um, we get the data 
from CMS, which is very unusual. We don't get like we don't get private commercial data. We don't even get the Medicaid data in the same way that we get the full look at the Medicare data. So we can target chronic diseases. We can put more clinical resources on that. We're doing all of that um, for those hundred thousand Medicare patients, and we think it's really prepped us to start having these great discussions with the NCOs about risk and Medicaid. So you've got 2,000 docs for your yeah. So I suppose you have some that are better and some that are worse. I think they're all great, but I suppose that could, that could potentially be. But there's probably some that are a little cut above. But how do you work with your physicians or your uh, medical professionals to ensure that they are providing that care to the patient? Yeah, so we. Um, for years have made a point of being a physician-driven clinic-driven um, organization. So our docs are involved on the government's boards at, at every, every part of this. Um, they have, so how we got those 100,000 patients, those were the patients of those doctors anyway. Those patients get assigned into that group by going to our primary. And so, and so they get, um, we get information about the quality metrics in regard to how they're caring for their patient base. And our ACO, our Accountable Care Organization, which is kind of like an administrative, is, is constantly working with our docs to say like, well, you know, you're meeting your quality metrics here, you're, and, and they're working together to manage that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, let's see if I can understand this real quick, because in my business, um, I have uh, suppliers for all sorts of products, uh, from aluminum to bearings to, to washers and facials and stuff. And I've got this one company that provides the aluminum, but they don't make the aluminum. They actually outsource it to another company. And so I pay them, effectively, an extra surcharge to kind of manage what's going on. And if I'm getting this right in my head, Effectively, the MCOs are subcontracting potentially with Unity Point to effectively do to a smaller group what they're already doing, which is taking the amount of money that's being allocated for those patients or for those members and saying, We're going to actually give a subcontract to you, and if you save money for us, then we'll share in the savings. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, my question for you is this this is the hard question. Why is the state of Iowa paying the middleman? The MCO is not going directly to you anyway. Well, that is an interesting question and, and really astute. Um, so, okay. Well, I mean, there's there's different ways to answer that, but I'm going to say it this way. The managed, in our view, managed care is here to stay. The state of Iowa chose to do that, and that's the system we have. We we um, are direct with the federal government in regard to ACOs. It doesn't have to be that way. But it's, it is that way here in the state of Iowa. Um, the managed care companies here in Iowa and the large providers, in my view, have not begun to tap into what the relationship could look like. There are things they handle we don't want to handle. And there's things we're really good at that we want to handle that we're not being allowed to handle yet. So what we're proposing, um, and we talked to Mickey and Mike about this all the time is we're proposing, you know, really getting together with the MCOs and kind of splitting up the duties and being on the same team. You know, when you have a basketball team of five people, you have a point guard and a center, although, you know, usually sometimes you don't have a center anymore because everybody wants to play guards, right? But so, you know, um, and you have the, the three and the four, and, the, and, and that's how we do think we can get together and divide up the duties. There is a lot of work to be done to get there, and that's where that this third part of what I was going to talk about in regard to what we're looking for in these subcapitation arrangements. Um, from the large integrated healthcare system, we're not going to be happy just with being subcapitated for our medical costs. I mean, alone. And, and trying to continually cut out our medical costs and share in the savings of lowering the medical costs lower and lower and lower. That's not going to work. Shared savings is not a good financing model for anyone. I mean, right? Like, how would you like to say, okay, you know what? Um, we're going to pay you what you got paid last year, and then if you can somehow 
make what you got paid le last year yeah, <laughs> less, we'll pay you back some um, of what you get. That's not a good financing, right? I mean, that's not a good way to finance any sort of organization, even if you're a nonprofit, to continually eat away at ourselves and try to earn back some of it. We don't want to be insured savings. We want to be, we want to know what our, just like the MCOs are, we need a capitated amount so we can, can work against that. But we, at least, and, and I don't speak on behalf of the other um, health systems, but we have some capability to do some other things that we'd like to share with the NCOs. We um, credential our own physicians. We have a credentialing company. We have a utilization management company in, out of Dubuque, or um, Quad Cities, Iowa, called Precedence that does really great work. They've done great work in behavioral health. Um, we're looking to do the utilization management for you know, our own attributed lives in our contract arrangements. We're looking to take on the care coordination and case management. Um, there are still things left to do. So that's where I mean this team approach is that we'd like to enter into some capitated arrangements that where Unity Point, because we're large and we're sophisticated, need to um, take on some of those administrative duties. And I think when, when that is the relationship we get to in the state of Iowa between the MCOs and the large health systems, that's when you're going to stop hearing a lot of these complaints about um, pre and appeals and this stuff because um, we'll have a, you know, a partnership that we feel comfortable with. I, I appreciate the, the explanation of that. To me, I think the direction we're moving is the right way to go. I think if Unity Point is capable of working directly with a contract with the federal government, they would be able to work directly with this contract with the state of Iowa, theoretically. Um, I, I am curious as to whether or not eventually it makes sense for the MCOs to be merging with Unity Point in order to have shared ownership and shared cost savings at, point, at some point in the future. I don't know if there's currently, and I asked last uh, presenters the same question, which I'll kind of point again. I'd like to understand from the legislator's point of view, if there's shared investments. In other words, do any of the MCOs have a minority share in Unity Point, or does Unity Point own anything in the minority share of the MCOs? I think from a financial standpoint, understanding that would make sense. Um, overall, it, I like the direction of it. I actually think that the MCOs at this point are working for the state of Iowa. Um, you know, I, I think we, we were changing. A few years ago, I was very concerned about the, the changeover. Um, Honestly, as time has gone by, a lot of the issues have been resolved. Um, so I, I do recognize that. But I think from a financial standpoint, we still have a multi-layered system where everyone's taking their margins from the taxpayers, and eventually we need to consolidate some of those down. And the question is, do we consolidate the MCOs to this value shared position? Do we allow the MCOs to do that directly for themselves? I don't know the answer to all those yet, but I just think that we're maybe getting too many layers in the process or we might need to consolidate it. So, thank you. So, question. So, you, you can point 100,000 people, clients, you know, addressing both Medicare and Medicaid. What about the other ACOs in the state? Where are they at this time? Where is Mercy on this issue? Where is Genesis on this issue? And I don't know what the universe Iowa. They had an ACO at one time, but it's not there right now. Where, where, where's the rest of our healthcare system in this state in comparison for you? Well, I wouldn't want to see on behalf of the other health systems, and I know that there are some representatives from them kind of in the back row. I know it's not Kate Walton, who I know works with Mercy. Um, in regard to, so ACO is, a, is an interesting term as well. It has the same it falls as value-based <laughs> purchasing in, in knowing what in the heck it really means. Um, how I've come to think of, I mean, ACO is a network. It's, it's basically a network of providers. Um, right now, the University of Iowa is in the Unity Point Health Network. So when we enter into an ACO contract, you get Unity Point and you get, you get the U. Um, so in regard to Mercy and Genesis, I do not know which contracts there. I, I know that Mercy's in some types of CMS programs. I don't know the details of them. I know that they are also in ACO programming with the federal government. I'm not sure about Genesis, so I don't I don't know about that. I've worked with 
state issues with, with justice. Um, but I think these discussions are great discussions. I mean, I, I applaud you for getting us here on this topic. I know this is like a crack of the, a can of worms, which, um, I mean, I work on it every day, all day long, just figuring out this little piece that, you know, you guys deal with 100 topics. So it's a complex topic. And, and it, but, but what I will say on it is we feel some immediacy in, in dealing with this. So when we hear kind of things like, well, over time and as we enter into this path and seven years from now, I mean, that really, I mean, the time is here. We've been talking about this for a long time about how providers need to trans transition away from paper service into value-based and when's that going to happen. And really, this, this <coughs> April 16, 2015 federal law <coughs> was put down lines in the sand of got to get here by then or, you know, you're going to be in big trouble. Um, so, and, you know, and, and it's not just this. So that's the physician side. Also, the Affordable Care Act on the, on the hospital side put in productivity adjustments, mandatory productivity adjust, downward productivity adjustments, which are taking, they're designed to take like $196 million out of hospital reimbursement over the next, I think, in, in, by 2036, however many years that is. But, so every year, you know, we're taking cuts on the hot map. I mean, and I'm not here to whine about how we don't pay. I'm just saying, like when you're look, when we're looking at the financing of our business, which I know that's not talking about the patient care perspective, and I don't mean to to underplay that or not address it, but from the healthcare financing perspective, we have to figure out as a system how to deal with this Medicaid piece and the Medicare piece and the, the risk mandates that have been put out there that really aren't talked about that much within the state house here, um, but our requirements of your provide all your providers in your state, not just you need money, you need every, everyone. So. I like what you had to say about shared savings. So as you progress, it looks like in the first year, and you start to catch in the next year, and as you go on, it, 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 it self-destructs. The whole the, the concept is wrong. It's not a good financing concept. It's not a way to stay in business. Um, it's just not. I mean, that's why getting decapitation seems scary to providers. But, you know, it's it's better to at least have the predictability. Here's your benchmark. And now you can adjust to, you know, to that benchmark and, and your, your workforce and all of the costs you have have to fit under that rather than to continually try to cut back from what you did last year. And here in Iowa, we just can't. We just can't cut back. We're, we're already really efficient in how we do care in Iowa. We just are. We're Iowans. That's how we do it. <laughs> so in other words, you, you're assuming risk. In, in, yes. And when you do this yes, value-based purchasing, yes. and the way you put together 100,000 people and getting a fixed amount of money yep. to serve these 100,000 people, you're taking Yes, we are. We're, we're, we're called, it's not full risk. We're in a downside risk contract. So there are, are limitations, but we, we absolutely could be in a situation where we have to pay, a, write a check back to CMS if we don't meet our benchmarks. Thank you for your presentation. This Sorry, That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you were talking, I came up with another question. So, <laughs> so I'll stay real thanks for being here today. So you mentioned that you wanted to have that contracting. You were hoping it would be in by 2019, but certainly by 2020. What happens if we don't have that? I and mean, what's the impact if we don't have that? Yeah. Well, so for us, we um, we need to meet that threshold of the patients that get, get into that. We can't meet that with our Medicaid or Medicare patients alone. So we'll either need to get into contracts like with Walmart or other commercial payers or others to get it up there if we can't get the Medicaid piece. Um, it should seem like the easiest way to do it would be to do all your government business. But um, the, the comment is called an other payer combination. And 
so you can take your Medicare patients and then you can add in Medicaid or, or commercial patients, but they have to be meeting, there's three terms, which you know, three things you have to do to be able to qualify, and you have to get the contracts up, up to that qualification. I will emphasize one of those three qualifications that's the most important, is that you have to bear more than nominal risk, which is, it, it's actually substantial. It's like 8% of your revenues or something have to be at risk um, to qualify for this, for this, um, this federal law. Thank you. So before we move, before we move on, I did, there's this whole issue of dual eligibility, Medicare and Medicaid. Our most expensive piece of health care yeah. is our dual eligibles. Mm -hmm. And it, there are difficulties. And both, there are two different animals. Uh, they're hard to put together and they're hard to share information between each other. I, I just wanted to bring that up because I know as you go on down the road with what you're doing, this dual eligibility and approach to it by your, by your organization is going to be. Thank you very much yeah. for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, we're going to have an MCO update, and um, next, next meeting on December 17th, we'll have you and I, you and I will see a CEO over here. Um, but today, we have two of our main two organizations represented by Jeff Jones again. Approach the table, the CEO of uh, Mayor Group and Iowa Total Care, our new partner in managed care, and you that are represented by Chris Priest, the interim CEO for uh, Iowa Total Care. Alias, thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me again and welcome to the table, Chris. So here. I believe uh, Representative Heaps and Costello, would you like us to go individually first? About 15 minutes apiece. Wonderful, so thank you. We'll jump off. Wonderful, thank you. We'll bridge here a little bit then. So uh, thank you again for having me. I'd like to pick up where we left off with the, the first time I was here. And for the new members of the committee, maybe share a little bit more about myself and my background very, very briefly here, if you will. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a proud veteran of the United States Marine Corps. And after my time in the service, I made my entry into the healthcare industry. I've actually been working with the Mayor Group for over 22 years now. Um, and in very early 2015, my wife and I made a decision to move our family to the, the state of Iowa. And uh, we have uh, three sons, uh, one who attends uh, college here in Iowa as a sophomore. We have a junior in high school and eighth grader as well. So they keep us very busy, but I think for those that haven't had a chance to meet, uh, it's always good to have a little bit of background on, on me. So uh, I'd like to spend the next few minutes providing you with updates on some of what our focus has been over the past few months. Uh, do a little bit of a recap of 18, if you will, um, and then uh, look forward to 2019 as well. I'd like to share some, some data and information with you and also share some member story as well, time allowing if we can get there. So, uh, you know, needless to say, I, you don't need to hear this from me, 2018 has been an extremely busy year for the managed care program here in Iowa. Um, a lot of key events going on, and it's it's interesting when you look back on it in hindsight, how much actually got accomplished and how much got done. Uh, and for a group, that included the transition of approximately 10,000 members from Mara Health to us in March of this year. Uh, expansion of the mental health core services following last year's very critical mental health reform bill this year's, including new services providers such as Assertive Community Treatment or ACT, uh, which I'm happy to say we have contract 100% of all and all are in our network at this point in time. Uh, the process improvement work groups that Director Randall talked about earlier was a very quick touch point, but it was a very significant investment in time and extremely productive sessions that we had there that identified many, many opportunities, both to improve that service outcome that we've talked about, but also identify further opportunities for administrative simplification. Um, 
federal mega reg rules this year were pretty significant. We required a lot of implementation, successful provider contract renewals, including the incorporation of value based purchasing that we just talked about. Uh, the state innovation model roundtable, the work groups focus on data management and healthy communities as part of the Healthy State Initiative. Um, all of this got done while at the same time accomplishing some very, very key goals in improving the health outcomes for our members. I'd like to share a couple of those briefly with you, if you will, uh, specifically for our mayor group. Uh, on tackling substance abuse, nationally we know the opioid epidemic drives an increase of about 60 members per month in treatment. And that's been the historical trend from 2016 to 2018. Uh, despite that uptick in members requiring that treatment, if you will, the use of emergency and inpatient detox for American members has been, remained relatively flat. And in correspondence to this, we've seen an uptick, a very, very significant increase in more appropriate substance abuse services for those same members. So a, de a decrease or not a corresponding increase in the use of ER inpatient, but yet uh, an increase in more effective and more appropriate substance abuse outpatient services. Um, on, on the topic of behavioral health services, uh, our inpatient usage continues to decline for our behavioral health population, uh, but at the same time, and correspondingly, our outpatient services continue to increase, um, as we would expect them to in that circumstance. Right care, right time, right place, and ensure the members are receiving the care where they need to. Uh, returning members to the communities is another one that's been a very, very significant focus of ours. Um, we have uh, uh, helped well over uh, 115 members transition out of a facility back into the community. Um, we have also expanded benefits from several hundred older Iowans as well over the last year uh, for those that are already transitioned to make sure they've got the full continuum of services and supports available so they can continue to living independently versus returning to the facility, uh, if you will. Um, and last but not least, uh, bringing out a state members home. So we fundamentally believe that if the appropriate care can be provided for our citizens in the state of Iowa, we should have them here being treated by the providers they trust and know. Um, sometimes that's not the case, and we do have to look outside of the state for augmentation. We certainly support that, encourage that, and work very, very closely with our members and providers to make sure that it's available. But we have been able to move over 36 of our members that have historically been out of state back in the Iowa in a safe setting, this the appropriate care they need. Um, and we, at this point in time, actually have 19 members that remain in our state placements uh, for our group. Um, while we focus on improving the overall health outcomes of our members, health outcomes of our members, and, and solve many successes, we've also been focused on soliciting feedback from our providers that relates to uh, their overall service experience with the Mirror Group. Um, we exist in many ways via voice through customer surveys, direct feedback, direct feedback and process improvement work groups. Um, and there was one bit of feedback that was very, very consistent for us that we made it a targeted goal to address, and that was the amount of time it took us